Today's session is a very interesting one, and it's something that I wanted to mix together for a while. It's English literature and psychology, and um, I thought I got an opportunity to do it now, so I thought, why not? Um, today, we are going to kind of review uh, literary texts and see how the how they can help us uh, be more aware, create more awareness, or and even how it can just inform and educate uh, teens and adolescents and everyone for that matter about mental health. There's also a special segment towards the end where we will be reviewing um, 13 Reasons Why the series as well as comparing it if we have time with the book and the adaptation. Uh, before we begin, I would like to introduce our speakers for today. We have Delilah Pacheco. She is an English literature professor at Parvati Vaichogle College. She deals with research in areas of pop culture, gender studies, film, and world literature. She oversees a, a student-run book chat club, which meets online every week by participants across Goa. Uh, welcome, Delilah. Thank you. Um, shall I begin? Uh, let me introduce the other okay. speaker. Okay. Yeah. And we also have uh, Ramya Warrior. She is a student of psychology and a vicarious learner and a uh, vicarious reader and a perpetual learner. She's interested in the field of psychopathology, emotion and motivation, and its neurobiology. She will be speaking or reviewing on 13 Reasons Why, and not only as a, a student of psychology, but also as someone who watches it and as a young adult. Now, um, Today, a little bit of, of today's topic, I did a little research, a little reading, because I had lost touch of literature when I moved to psychology. Uh, I read a lot of, uh, I read a lot of studies that discovered that reading increases social awareness and empathy. A uh, peer review study stated that um, people who read and who get transported by what they read become more empathetic and become more self-aware. Students also reported that reading a book that uh, portrayed mental illness or portrayed a character who had mental health issues, they later reconsidered the preconceived notions that they had about individuals with mental illnesses. For us, we grew up, or depending on which school you went to, from ninth standard onwards, we were asked to read Shakespeare. A lot of popular texts from Shakespeare, like Hamlet, uh, Julius Caesar, Romeo and Juliet, Macbeth. And, and most of these uh, texts have, or have portrayed uh, characters that have mental illnesses. For example, there is suicide ideation in Romeo and Juliet and depression and suicide in Hamlet. However, it's sad that those weren't really the areas that the text focused on. Um, so yeah, the, there is a reason why the session is aimed for young adults and adolescents. Uh, it's mainly twofold. One is that this is the age we can sensitize y'all. This is the age where you'll try to understand and y'all you'll can uh, spread and make a change. Uh, and also, one, uh, secondly, the books that are written for teens and adolescents, at least 30% of them have a character of mental illness in them. Uh, Delilah will now explain, will be better to explain uh, how it works and how the author and what the readers should be looking for and things like that. So off, off to you, Delilah. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, am I audible? audible? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So uh, thank you, Kelly. Um, so as Kelly introduced me, uh, my name is Delilah Sheko. I'm a professor of English literature at Padgibai Chogle College. Um, 
uh, I thank all of counseling and Kelly for giving me this opportunity to present to all of you during this session. Uh, <clears throat> please do let me know if uh, uh, my audio starts getting patchy because then I can uh, switch off the video, okay? So uh, I would like to present a small PPT. Okay, so um, we'll begin by talking about, I'd like to talk about my um, experience with understanding what uh, mental health is and uh, telling you guys about my childhood. So during my childhood, I had no uh, in, uh, inkling of what it meant to be mentally healthy. For me, um, I was taught that as a child, I should be playing well with my peers, studying well in school and being a good child to my parents. And besides that, there was no, no notion of what it meant to be depressed, what it meant to be sad, it was okay to be sad. Nobody said that to us. And the very first time that I actually saw any sort of uh, 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 literature or some sort of TV show that had something to do with mental health and the uh, conditions that you have uh, was the show Monk. So this, this is a show that ran in the 2002. Yeah, it was in 2002. It was in the Star uh, Channel and it was telecasted for six seasons. Now, if you can see, um, I'll make it full screen. Um, so the monk posters heavily focused on this man who developed a, a very um, serious form of OCD that he uh, got after the passing away of his wife. So this is basically uh, post-traumatic and he developed this and they play on the fact that he is an obsessive compulsive detective. Okay. And he uses this sort of like my uh, sense towards understanding minute details about things in his external surroundings that makes him a great detective. So um, during the show and like talking to my friends about the show, I found that a lot of us tend to use terminologies like OCD uh, for people who maybe mutter to themselves or can't function in a quote unquote normal way or um, are disruptive to their friends, uh, incon an inconvenience to their colleagues, uh, maybe people who have hot and cold behavior, uh, they are called bipolar, just for no reason at all. And um, so that kind of propelled me towards understanding what it really meant to be somebody who possesses a condition of this sort. Now today we're gonna to be talking about um, can literature genuinely help us understand what mental health is? So this is my agenda for today. I'll be talking about stereotyping, the benefits of reading mental health books, what is literature, responsible reading, writing for mental health, the role of the author, uh, can literature really help improve mental health, and reading recommendations. Okay. Um, so. What I'd like to mention is, uh, why should we read? Now, a lot of people say that um, you, they'd like to know more about uh, mental health conditions, but there's nobody really who can, they can talk to. And they are kind of afraid to talk to older, older uh, individuals that might judge them based on the questions that they ask. So um, th this is where literature comes in, especially I'll be doing about fiction today. Nonfiction would be a discussion for another time, but you're welcome to ask questions and recommendations. So the knowledge of another person's mental state can help you be a responsible peer responder. Now, what is a peer responder, you'll ask? A peer responder is somebody who is able to develop skills to guide and support emotional learning all around. Okay, so they uh, understand and empathize with a person who's genuinely going through a mental health condition, as well as they are able to counsel some, now I use the word counsel in a very generalized way, to counsel or to advise other people as to how they should be reacting um, amongst their peers in an informal or a formal way, form, no sorry, just an informal way. So there is an article that you could read, uh, which is here at the bottom of the screen, 
I I will come back to what a pure responder is a little later. We'll just move on. So, what is literature? For this session, like I said, I'll be talking about just fiction books. And the question that I have, this question that I pose to uh, friends and uh, students of mine, everybody say, first thinks about libraries. They, th they think about uh, a huge stack of books, books that cannot be accessed easily. They think about um, long, boring writings by some old guy and uh, something that is so convoluted and put together so difficult like to understand that you feel that the literature is telling you, you shall not pass. Okay. Now, it is uh, increasingly difficult that a lot of fiction and um, literature is, that is taught in schools are unrelatable to its audience. We tend to develop an aversion towards reading lengthy texts. So immediately when we have nothing to read, we have no knowledge entering our conscious that we can you know, debate and discuss about with our friends. So what do we do? We go towards our phones and we go to things like Twitter, text messaging and Instagram. Okay. So in um, uh, every word that you put in Twitter and every text that you send out, even the terribly tiny tales that you double tap on Instagram contains the seed of what can turn into literature. Now, whether it's a legitimate uh, exception, uh, legitimate inclusion to the canon of what is literature, will on, time will only tell. But a lot of us prefer reading shorter stories or prefer reading shorter poems because they are e easy to digest. Okay, now. What I really want to say is this. When we read, we must read with a sense of responsibility. The words we read on social media tend to take a life of its own in our minds when we take them seriously. Now, acclaimed author Shashi Deshpande writes with conviction okay, when she says that it is a shame that people relegate reading and literature with a capital L um, to something that they do only when they have the free time. She bemoans the fact that uh, people distinguish between fiction and non-fiction simply based on the assumption that fiction is just imaginary stories, stories that are not serious, stories that cannot help anybody if you want to get smarter. Okay, I beg to differ. Um, so what I would say is novels, you can understand them as simulations. Okay, uh, so it is also, sorry, it is always a question of what if, and that is very fascinating. Literature of, of, about mental health is the same thing. We cannot know exactly when, what someone is suffering from uh, in a mental health condition and experience it unless it happens to us. It gives us that window into understanding this, okay? Finding a good book, I would say, even if it's on mental health or anything else, is like finding a comfortable pair of shoes. Okay? You have other people suggesting that, hey, this pair looks nice. But at the end of the day, it is you who has to go through this mountain load of uh, shoes and find one that fits you, one that you truly identify with. And keep in mind that authors are human too. A book on mental health that is a good one uh, is one where you understand to empathize for the protagonist or your main or your other main character uh, while being led through by the author. Okay. So, books on mental health up till very very recently were not of all the rage. Uh, why do you think this is a question that I would pose to a lot of you? Why do you think that there was a surge in titles that talk about depression, anxiety, stress, suicide, stigma related to mental health? I think that the fact that more people are claiming ownership over what they read uh, has increased the buzz of conversation on the topics that have and have kept growing louder and louder and louder. In today's impatient world, where we have no time to spend reading big books, we want immediate gratification, and this is very dangerous. When we read books or even consume television, 
uh, we have found shortcuts to hasten our discovery of what happens next. Now, what does this do? This robs us of the emotions that we tend to go through when we are being uh, uh, led by the author to accompany our main characters. Okay, um, and we don't like feel the feels, so to say. Um, what I'm saying is this. Okay. If the reader base of any sort of literature makes well-informed demands of what they want to read, the writer is held to an ethical and moral responsibility to write better and write for his or her audiences. Now, when an author, a good author, uh, sits down to write a piece, they begin their process of stringing together lives of people they are histories and they are renewed experiences that the author starts spinning into comprehensible narratives with structure, style, and flow. But remember this, the audience always is the one that awards value to the book or meaning to the piece. Okay? Take the novel 13 Reasons Why, for example. A book that had such graphic depiction of bullying and teenage suicide with such an uh, made such an earnest audience base that it was this the fact that it happened was unthinkable just a couple of years ago. Now we have writer and philosopher, American writer and philosopher Susan Sontag, and she says this about a novel: a novel worth reading is an education of the heart. It enlarges your sense of human possibility, of what human nature is of what happens in the world, it's a creation of inwardness. Okay? Um, <clears throat> a book on mental health is not a prescription drug towards unlocking all the secrets of a disorder. A lot of people, friends, um, students, and uh, uh, people that I know feel that if they find somebody that, you know, is trying to understand what a particular mental disorder is about, they recommend a book. Now, recommending a book is all good, but you cannot recommend uh, the, a book to somebody hoping and assuring them that all the answers will be within the book itself. The book is mere stepping stone towards beginning their journey towards understanding what the mental health disorder is. Um, now, uh, I like to talk about uh, what Susan Sontag again says about information and illumination when it comes to the author. Now, the author's responsibility when it comes to mental health literature is very, very, very important. Okay, and she says this: information will never replace illumination. If being both a writer and a public voice could stand for anything, it would be that writers would consider the formulation of opinions and judgments to be a difficult responsibility. Another problem with opinions, they are agencies of self-immobilization. Now, this is what is important. What writers do should free us up, shake us up, open avenues of compassion and new interests. Remind us that we might, just might, aspire to become different and better than we are. Remind us that we can change. So, now this is the main question that we're asking today, right? Can literature really help improve mental health? Yes, yes it can. When we become prudent readers and the writers we subscribe to become pursuers of truth, rather than that of hype, literature can send you places. Here are some examples. Now, Gail Honeyman's award-winning debut novel, Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine, is a charming insight into the life of the eccentric Miss Oliphant. Uh, she, people consider her as a loner, an outcast, and because of her lack of social skills, they exclude her from everything. Honeyman spins the tale of Eleanor in a way that has the reader develop an immediate connection with the insecurities, the apprehensions, and the challenges of transitioning into adulthood with no one to hold your hand. 
I'm not going to spoil it for you, but the book is much more than just this. And there are very, uh, there are a lot of twists in the book. I highly recommend you pick it up if you want a good read, a quick read, and a funny one. So, um, the next one that I like to talk about is M in the Big Home. Now, Jerry Pinto is one, uh, um, an author from our own country, and I think we should be encouraging everybody to read books on mental health from India itself. I do understand that America and the rest of the world is doing great things when it comes to mental health literature, but I feel that by buying a book that is by an Indian author, we are encouraging people to write more books on mental health. So, M in the Big Home is by author Jerry Pinto, who is a Mumbai-based writer and translator. And M, who is our protagonist, is a dashing, domestic, and dangerously witty mother. Um, and she is the and who uh, and we have the narrator who lives with his family in Mahem, Mumbai. Life of this family revolves around M, uh, not, uh, who and not only her caregivers, uh, because they it is an interaction between M, the family, and her bipolar disorder, which is a character on its own. Um, it, it this book teaches us what it means to have a support system and it, ha it um, resonates with a family going through the highs and lows of somebody who has, somebody in the family who has bipolar disorder. Now, these are two more books that I'd like to focus specifically on, then we'll move on to a more comprehensive list. So the third book I like to talk about is Fun Home. It is a graphic novel. So this is a genre that not a lot of people pick up, but I'd say if you like uh, visual storytelling, then this is a definite uh, like an, a pick that you should be thinking about. So Alison Beckdale uh, is the illustrator and the writer of this story. And she talks about her, it's a memoir, and she talks about her exploration of her relationship with her father her discovery of her OCD and the coming to terms with her sexuality. Okay, so that's a, that's an awesome. It's, it's a combination of different themes, and it's a great, great read. Then the fourth uh, um, mention that I like to make would be the short story, The Yellow Wallpaper, it's by Charlotte Perkins Gilman, and it's a thriller of sorts. Uh, it is about the treatment of women during 19th century America and what it meant to uh, take care of somebody who had mental illness. It's a great story, very quick read. Now, this is a, a, a list on books that are considered as young adult fiction. Now, young adult fiction is not just for young adults. I'd really like to encourage you to think of it that way. The books are addressing complex, complex issues that you'd, you'd see now but um, they are really important issues that you should be talking about. If you missed out talking about it in your early teenage years, it's fine. Not, no time is too late. I'd, I'd tell you to just think of picking one of them up, okay? Um, so the first one that I'd like to talk about is the Burn Journals. So the Burn Journals is a memoir on the of the writer's list, uh, sorry, a writer's journey through surviving suicide. It's a series of diaries. So the books, the third, fourth, and uh, uh, the second, third, and fourth book come a little later. This is the first one. The Burn Journals is the first one. Um, it talks about a very detailed narration of what uh, the writer was thinking, what the writer is feeling, the interactions he had with people around him, and so on. Um, then uh, I can't, uh, should I go through all? I think, okay, I'll go through uh, all of them, but I'd focus on some uh, for a little bit longer, okay? So Will Grayson, Will Grayson is a book by John Green and uh, David uh, Leviathan, and it talks about two characters, two protagonists, both named Will Grayson, and both of them go through the journey of personal identity and sexu uh, the search for sexuality and from the point of view of the boys. Then we have Cut. Now, Cut, if you can uh, think about it for a couple of seconds, is about um, trying to take your life um, by cutting yourself. And the protagonist embarks on a journey of self-discovery. She talks about, uh, initially she doesn't want to talk about it, but 
after she receives support from friends family and her therapist she starts opening up starts acknowledging why she thought of cutting herself the very the very action of bodily harm is a, a huge deal it it takes huge commitment it takes a lot of courage to take that very very fatal step and this book does a marvelous job of going through the emotions and it takes you for a ride um then we have lisa bright and dark lisa is a happy and beautiful 16 year old very very normal girl and this is when her shift of uh, uh shifts of person not personality shifts of mood starts occurring she starts having really really high um sensations feelings of happiness um um and joy and then she has really really dark days where she just doesn't see any way out of the pit um it talks about the definition of what it means to be normal does does the term apply to anybody is what the, is a question that we tend to ask after reading this book normalcy is overrated there are a lot of people who say hey that's not normal um she or he is not acting in a normal way so the whenever we use words like that we need to step back and think about what does that can even the word even using the word normal in a normal sense is quite dangerous and it affects a lot of people so yeah that is one of the books then kissing no donuts this is a book that i enjoyed because of the way it takes you through the life of tara so tara uh, develops ocd she develops ocd the way a lot of people start showing signs uh, she starts convincing herself that if she doesn't do a certain thing if she doesn't say it, bunch of words in that precise uh, sequence her mother or somebody that she loves they get harmed they might die and in order to save her mother and herself and everybody else she starts going through the motions of what uh, or people with ocd and similar conditions start doing then uh, this is uh, the next book is a famous one uh, the perks of being a wallflower it uh, was adapted into a movie uh dearly loved by a lot of people uh, i'd encourage you to read the book because uh, a lot of times what happens is there are a couple of pieces that are normally left out which is interesting i would i'll i'll talk about it in the next book but uh, the book's being a wolf flag gives you additional insight into what is the main character of charlie what is he thinking about belonging what does it mean to be part of society part of a friend group who is charlie um who is i that's the question that this book takes us like asks us and takes us on a journey uh, on then 13 reasons now we'll be talking about this a little later but i'd like to point out that this is one of the few books that um has more additions made in the adaptation rather than in the book that's it let's personal opinion um the the main the main narrator is not as uh like integral to this story except like you know connecting the dots he takes us along but he doesn't involve himself too much into hana baker's story the girl who commits suicide um we we'll talk about that in reasons why a little later so i'll just skip this for now now winter girls is also a very nice book it's about body image and about societal perceptions of the human body now we for whatever reason in india we shy away from talking about our bodies what it means to have a perfect body now when i say a perfect body this is the same argument that i make when we use the word normalcy what is normal what is perfect these are just words that are place holders that we can give it's like the lazy way out we don't we don't want to describe what we mean by perfect or what we mean by normal because if we do we'll realize that we have 40 definitions of what it means to be perfect so this book takes us on like a really a really really nice narrative of uh, this con- uh, this competition between Leah and Cassie Leah and Cassie are competing against each other to have the thinnest body now this is a dangerous mission to anybody and uh anorexia and bulimia are very serious topics that not everybody talks about 
and um, yeah, so that that's that's a good pick if you wanna explore further the question of like what's a healthy body image. And um, lastly, for the novel by a novel section, I have Starved. So Starved is a novel by Nathan Thompson, and Starved. Uh, following the same uh, thinking is about body image as well. Um, our protagonist, uh, sorry, I said the author. The author is Michael Thomas. Uh, the protagonist is Nathan Thomas. Um, so Nathan is a young boy who has eating disorder and he doesn't want to acknowledge that he has it. And his parents try to help him. He has a supportive um, uh, family and friend group behind him, but he doesn't want to acknowledge the fact that he has it. Now, uh, I think Kelly and Ramya will be able to tell you more about this, but the first step that you need to take in order to actually doing something about uh, living through a mental disorder would be to acknowledging that you have one and acknowledging it in a healthy way. And if you do need somebody to, you know, hold your hand and look through this with you, then you do need the support of family, friends, and a therapist at times. And um, this book is a great example of like finally acknowledging uh, things that are going on to the darkness. Then, uh, this is an addition I've made. If you're into poetry, then you probably will like it. So the, there are three recommendations that I'll make for the poetry section, if you'd like to pick out any of them. Emily Dickinson is the first one. I, I know most of you will think that hey, she's a little bit of an older um, poet, but I'd uh, ask you to think about this. There, is, there are very few people like Emily Dickinson who talk about the death, talk about macabre, talk about self-isolation and mortality the way Dickinson does. There is a magical quality of what she uh, takes you through. And what is such a uh, a, a wonderful thing that once you <clears throat> you don't need to have a preamble you don't need to say that okay today I'm going to finish this poem and I shall understand it there is no time limit to understanding and comprehending a poem you have to read the poem and then close the book and keep it on the side and then think about it a truly good poem is one that remains with you one that you will remember not the quote exactly but you will remember the message when you are thinking or you know mulling over something that has to do with that particular topic now dickinson herself was somebody that preferred self relation as a way of life now she wrote very unconventional poetry and a lot of people thought that hey uh, She's a bit of a weirdo, but now depends on what you call her or whom you call a weirdo. This is the same thing with Dickinson. She talks about death, Im uh, immortality, and spirituality above all. Then we have Sylvia Plath and Atexton. Now, both Texton and Plath I can talk about for a long time, but I've put them together because they ended up being friends and ended up producing a lot of poetry for similar reasons as well as in the company of each other. Now, Plath and Texton, um, were the, they they went through a lot of um, uh, suicide suicidal tendencies and um, what Plath and Sexton ended up doing is they ended up honing their uh, the the very dark impulses that they were having they ended up honing it into their creativity and put it into poem form. Now Plath talk Plath and Sexton belong to a, a a group of poetry like called uh, confessional. Now, confessional, as you can probably interpret, is about talking face to face with your reader and not hiding anything. It is about uh, confessing your deepest, darkest emotions. And if you feel that, you know, you need to face emotions in its, their raw form, then I would highly recommend you read Plus or Sex. Um, sorry. Right. So then, uh, I'd like to make a couple of suggestions before I wind up. Uh, what do novels do for us? This is a question that I've always asked myself and I have found that novels give us the ability to walk a mile in someone else's shoes in a meditative and a personal way. Reading can be highly, highly therapeutic. It, it 
calms the mind and i think that um if you have a friend or an acquaintance or somebody that you know or even yourself if you're suffering from any mental con- mental health condition then i uh, and you're afraid to ask um, ill informed questions and you don't want to you know straight away go out and talk to somebody i'd say pick up a book pick up a good book on mental health that addresses this issue and see what they have to say they won't answer all your questions but, but they will start you on a journey and starting is the most important thing um uh, and uh, this is a personal recommendation that i'll make when you are reading sorry when you are reading i uh, i think that it would be nice if you have a friend group and have a reading group of sorts um because when you read widely and you demand for better literature you have good books coming out and by asking each other what did you think of the book what did you think of the poem you kind of sometimes get pieces that you missed out on and somebody else got it and then the mutual satisfaction that you get of saying hey i saw the same thing too in the book and then you discuss that is what enriches lives and i think that that is the best way to you know finish the experience of reading um and it also helps you ask this argument question what does it mean to be alive um i think that when we ask this question we are trying to work on ourselves reading does help that it helps us work on ourselves and we are responsible to ourselves to be kind to ourselves we are very very rarely do we stop pause and think about like, am i treating myself the way i should be treating and um i think that literature does help you that way it it helps you pause and especially these days when we have a lot of time on our hands i think that picking up a book and just sitting in a quiet corner will definitely help you out. and yeah those are my two cents these are my references uh, i'd i'll send the slides to kelly a little later if you'd like that and you can contact me on my email address that's my email thank you very much okay to laila uh, i think the suggestions of the books that you gave us as uh, young adults especially cover a lot of things that as as pro- uh, we as professionals want to uh, spread out and you know make people aware of so if you do have the time do go through those suggestion list and read them if you have any questions for delila do put it back in the chat box and we will ask them after we finish with the next so um now we are going to talk about a review uh 13 reasons why which it has been very very popular for many reasons uh there's been a lot of controversies around it there's also been a lot of um questionable acts that were caused because of it but then again that's that's up to everyone's uh, assumptions and everyone's opinions so i think ramya will will give us an comprehensive uh, outlook on both sides one being the whole controversial around it and one being whether it's actually something that spreads awareness or gives a proper portrayal of how mental health is how people around mental uh, someone who's going through mental illness and health issues act so ramya over to you yeah so um hi everyone um uh, kelly ma'am and uh, olive counseling thank you so much for um giving me the opportunity to be here today and uh, it's been a great pleasure even listening to dilala ma'am um so as uh, dilala ma'am spoke about uh, the importance of literature as a form of uh, as a medium of speaking about mental health and making more and more people aware about it it garners an even larger audience when such books are adapted into the form of visual media okay either in the form of a movie or in the form of a tv series like um, dilala also spoke about so what i will be telling you today is about the show of 13 reasons why which is an adaptation of uh, j asher's book and the first season was released in the year 2017 and since then we've had uh, four seasons and the last season was just recently released on the 5th of june so um what i would like to tell you is what the show actually depicts 
the kind of um, issues that you know they have broken the silence over and they have brought out for the mainstream audience all over the world and uh, how we can actually apply it in our lives and what do what can you do as a person for the people around you or for yourself um so that is what i'll be talking about um so uh, beginning with um, i would like to say that uh, one good thing that i like about the show is that they went beyond what the book had to offer so uh, the first season of the show is what is based on the book solely and uh, they went ahead to make three more seasons beyond the book and in that they brought about a range of so many issues that teens and or young adults especially go through and like what are the consequences of it and how do they deal with it and like you know the ways that they choose to deal with it like you know whether they are right they are wrong and who is to judge that i mean who are we to judge that and how do they go about it and how can we help them so um when i began watching this show like uh, kelly said that it's been a little bit of a controversy because it deals with a lot of uh, harsh realities in our world and it's been very graphically depicted so when it's a book like you know at least some things are left to the imagination but when it's a show they have actually shown everything that happens and and partly that is in an effort to actually make people realize the you know gravity of the situation and what actually the kids go through so um that is something i would appreciate and applaud the makers of the show for being so honest and so brutal about uh, the reality well uh, the show and the book is based in an american high school and it uh, shows the milieu and the kind of environment that the kids study in there and how things go for them so we might not be able to relate to each and every uh, issue that they show um, you know because uh, we have a uh, cultural differences but there are a lot of fundamental issues that exist everywhere even here or anywhere else it's just that maybe it's not as much spoken of here as much uh, as it is there so that show the book can actually be an inspiration for us as well to start talking about it and maybe even make shows like that um so that we are also more vocal about um such issues so um i'll be speaking about as kelly said of what both i love about the show and some uh, small criticisms that i have about it so let's begin with what i love about the show so um one major thing uh is that so it begins with uh, so i know that there are a lot of people who haven't watched the show uh here uh, in with the meeting with us right now so um i'll try not to give out a lot of uh, spoilers uh, nor make any assumptions that you will know the characters so even if i do mention a character i'll try and give a little background um okay so um the first season begins with uh, the suicide of the protagonist or the main character in the first season that is hanna baker uh, like it is in the book so it begins with the suicide of uh, hanna baker and how that led to a series of events and what all happened and through those series of events you know what caused her death what led her to that and you know even when she was going through so much parallelly there were other children and other storylines who were also going through so much and how they were dealt with and like you know the way they decided to deal with their issues so um first of all when we speak of her suicide and uh, like you know the first um response that you get from anyone if you tell uh, them that someone committed suicide is that why like you know wasn't there any other option like why did they have to do that i mean they could have done this they could have done that so before we come to all those conclusions and make any judgments or like you know give reasons of our own uh, we need to look at all the possible causes that can exist towards a person taking a step like this so in the show uh the different issues that they bring up uh, which led to the suicide of uh, hanna baker and uh, while doing that they show off the issues of the other children as well um is the first one is of cyberbullying now uh, cyberbullying is something that is very very existent especially in today's era of social media uh where people use the screens as a wheel uh to do anything and everything that they want because they use the anonymity of the screen to actually uh spread hatred and actually bring a person down to bits and uh, cyberbullying can be so 
penetrating in its effect and we sometimes even don't realize that a simple comment someone that has made on your post can have so much impact on that person so cyberbullying was something that was shown in 13 reasons why where hannah baker a photo was um, spread around of her and a lot of rumors spread because of that that you know about her character and all of that so that was something that she started dealing with and uh, and over on top of that there was also things like slut shaming uh, body shaming and uh, even body image issues so she was uh, slut shamed in school uh, because of the photo that went around and uh, she there was also a lot of body shaming when it came to the other kids as well and here during teenage it's a stage of self exploration for all the teenagers you know it's a um stage of physical exploration mental exploration sexual exploration so they they are just trying to learn about themselves and know who they are and like you know how their body works and like uh what all can be done with it so at this stage when they are forming an image for themselves when such comments are passed it can affect the body image that they have of themselves and how they see themselves and it can you know lead to a lot of issues and they cannot cope with it so uh, that is what uh, happened with hana bekum and lot of comments were made on her body and like you know anonymous comments were written and uh, uh, the, uh, another student with body issues was also alex who is another character in the show uh, you know so it's not just girls who deal with it it's both boys and girls so he had an issue because he was very scrawny and um, like you know was not as well built as the athletes of the school uh, like you know who everyone ruled over so he had an issue because of that and uh, like you know even his body image was affected because of it she even ended up using um, steroids and uh, things like that because he wanted to become like the others and thought that that might make him more admirable so um, at this stage when you're exploring your sexuality uh, another thing that comes up that has been shown in the show is uh, the topic of homosexuality and bisexuality now this is a point where uh, the makers of the show have divulged from the book uh, the characters in the book have not been uh, revealed to be homosexual or bisexual but they have tried to incorporate that issue into the show which is another nice thing because uh, it's mostly at this stage at the teenage age when they are exploring themselves they try to explore their sexuality and come to a conclusion of who they are so um uh, one character in the show who is um, shown to be homosexual is uh, tony um so they have shown two different sides so tony was a person who had already made peace with his sexuality he knew he is homosexual and he was very open about it and he knew how he had to go about it even a character ryan who was also openly homosexual and then there are characters like um alex and charlie who come about in, the, in later on seasons who discover their sexualities later on so uh they were like you know with other sexual partners and as they grow up and as they have different experiences that is when they explore and uh, realize that this is what their sexual identity is so now there they've also shown the conflict of you know of having this realization because even after having realized or maybe gotten a hint of maybe i am a uh, bisexual or homosexual um you know the conflict that they have within themselves that you know even though they were with their you know same sex partners uh you know even though they were having a good time and they realized that this is what they wanted they still said that okay i am not gay or i am not homosexual because that is a conflict with yourself you yourself are not able to accept that you know this is the truth but then they've also shown of how those kids went ahead and opened up to their families and the families were shown to be very accepting of it and um, so yeah that was another issue that came otherwise if the family is not uh, very open about it, it can lead to a lot of stress and uh, mental issues uh, thereafter uh, another issue that was dealt with in the show and uh, was very prominent throughout the seasons is that of sexual assault and rape so um Hannah Baker who's a protagonist also went underwent uh, rape and sexual assault and another uh, character in the show as well uh, went through that and they have focused on both sexual assault against females as well as males 
um, because uh, that is something that needs attention because whenever you speak about sexual assault all the attention goes towards women and that's why men are just there silenced and they don't even speak out about it and even if they do people don't give them much attention or maybe even not believe that you know anything might have happened or they just reduce the you know importance of their experience so they have shown both of how a sexual assault can affect uh, their mental health and how it broke her completely after which she went ahead and uh, committed suicide so um, that was one issue and uh, i'll be speaking about later about how she went ahead to gain to seek help after that um another issue um while this was happening is of drug and sexual abuse sorry not sexual substance abuse so um drug abuse and substance abuse has also been widely shown throughout the show um so a particular character in the show by name justin he is the one who has been most prominently uh, shown as a victim of substance abuse because uh, he was brought up in a home where his mother was a drug addict and had uh, a lot of on and off boyfriends who were also either drug addicts or drug dealers so and he also faced sexual abuse because of that at a very young age so how he grew up in that environment and how he dealt with all the conflicts that he had and then again ended up in this world of substance abuse and it has also been shown of the actual effects that it can have on you and you know he was such a nice athlete who was doing so well in school but then after he ran away and got into drugs how it deteriorated his health it deteriorated his um you know studies sports everything and then uh, how difficult it was for him to come out of it he went into rehab and he worked for a lot of months there and then he came back and after some time he again relapsed back to it and how difficult it is um to actually deal with such things and then later on he, it was also found that uh, he had contracted an std so uh, they all they show how one thing can lead to another and how it's you know you find yourself in a swirl of problems like you know you're trying to deal with one problem you go for another solution and that solution gives rise to another problem so he was trying to deal with the stress in his life and turn towards drug for drugs for it and that you know gave rise to another problem so that is something that teenagers all over the world are going through right now and which needs to be dealt with um so like i said uh, like justin's childhood they have shown about uh, childhood abuse uh, they have also shown the issue of parental neglect uh, which was also seen uh, in the character of bryce walker in the show so how he faced parental neglect and other children who had faced uh, childhood abuse and how it affected them when they uh, grew up and uh, uh, another issue is of uh, violence and rage uh which can which is a byproduct of a lot many issues and uh, how they had to deal with it and how they needed therapy and uh, uh how one character named tony he had anger issues and he had to undergo therapy for that so that is another issue that uh, teenagers face um so throughout this show throughout the four seasons in the story there were different uh, there were different even uh, clinical conditions shown Uh, of psychopathology um to name a few um there was bipolar shown uh who you know sky miller there was a character in the first and second season she was suffering from bipolar disorder where she used to have episodes of depression and uh, mania uh they also showed the disorder of depression and that was a very prominent one throughout the show because uh, clay jensen was uh, clay jensen was a very important character throughout the show was undergoing and they've even shown anxiety panic attacks and uh, these issues have been more prominently shown in the final season where a lot has happened and it has taken a toll on them uh, where now it is not just the death of hanna baker that has happened but a lot of crimes have taken place after that and you know they have done things against their conscience and how they are dealing with it now they have the guilt that they have to deal with and like you know um, clay jensen was even having a lot of hallucinations it began with just uh, visual uh, hallucinations which went on to auditory hallucinations and it was affecting his uh, daily uh, like you know routine life so much that um, he even went into dissociation so dissociation is another part of the disorder 
uh, which is uh, DID. So he was doing uh, things that he himself was not aware of. So he was uh, going around and doing things, pretty dangerous things. And then later on, he had no memory of having done that. And uh, that is when you realize how serious his condition has gotten. So um, that was another thing that was shown in the last season. Um, and they have also shown the effect of trauma uh, in something called PTSD, which is the post-traumatic stress disorder of all the kids who had undergone so much trauma and how they dealt with it and what effect it had on, on them later on, you know, for a long time. It didn't just go away. So these were the issues that were shown in the show and some of them which they said led to the suicide of Anna Baker and they've also shown other people who were also suicidal but didn't actually commit suicide but they also had similar reasons to you know even have those suicidal thoughts so now coming to uh, our present times and like you know with people around us we often times say that uh, when you know someone has committed suicide we are no one to judge them because uh, we often say that, you know, that's such a silly reason. Like, you know, why did they have to commit suicide just because that happened? Now, when we say that or when we make any judgments like that, what we need to remember is that for such people or children or teenagers, to be uh, specific, uh, they some oftentimes have an inability to express what they are feeling. So uh, we might say that, you know, what you whatever you're feeling just you know just speak about it just tell me but it's not that easy like you know when they say that you know i cannot find the words to express what i'm going through they're being honest okay um because they themselves cannot understand what exactly is it that they're going through all they feel is that they are a mess so at that time they do not find the right words to explain it and there's also been research done for this and it has actually been found that um, teenagers do find this problem of you know actually expressing what they're feeling so oftentimes because of that they hold back um, and another thing is that the teenager brain and the adult brain are different okay most of people don't know about this but the frontal lobe in the teenage brain is not fully developed okay as it is in adults and it is not developed mostly until the age of 25 so uh, adults mostly think with their prefrontal cortex which is the rational thinking part of the mind so the teenagers their prefrontal cortex has not been developed as much and so their rational thinking is somewhere hampered to some level because of which when they face some pain or distress in life it feels like it will last forever because of that, because they don't use their prefrontal cortex for rational thinking, it feels like this pain, this emotion is going to last forever and that I'm never going to come out of this. So that is why at this stage, uh, suicidal thoughts are even more uh, as compared to other stages and which is why they go with uh, such uh, fatal measures. So we need to keep this in mind uh, while dealing with uh, children like this and we just cannot make uh, comments about them. And when we are dealing with anyone who has a mental issue or like, you know, is going through any sort of uh, mental struggle, we need to make sure we don't assume anything about them. And uh, even when we are speaking to them, uh, we do not know what the severity of the issue is when it has begun or what they are going through at the moment. And sometimes the issue can be neurological. And so at that time, if a person says that, you know, if the person is showing symptoms of depression or being uh, you know, sad for prolonged periods, uh, they can't just cheer up, like, you know, just talking to someone or like just listening to some music or doing some other thing. They can't just cheer up, like, you know, if you just tell them to. Like, for example, if someone has a fever, now I'm not saying they are similar in any way, but just to draw an analogy, if someone, you check their temperature and you realize that they have a fever, you won't say that, okay, you've been through this before, just reduce your temperature, come on. Okay, you can't do that, right? You have to give them the medication that they need and the rest that they need so that they can come out of the fever. So exactly like that, when the condition is neurological, just saying that, okay, come out of it won't help. So they need professional help so that, and you, uh, according to the problem that they're facing, they might need counseling, they might need psychotherapy, and they might need medication, or they might need a combination of one or two or all three. So uh, for that, they need professional help. So once you're talking, if you're 
realize that the person's issue is a little more severe so it's always better to recommend them to someone uh, who will be in a better position to um, help them um, uh, also when they do not get uh, this help that they need that is when they come up with coping mechanisms of their own okay which is like self-harm uh, like you know either cutting themselves or doing any other sorts of self-harm or um, like, you know, not eating for a long time. Now, these might not be coping mechanisms in the sense of the term, but it is the only action that feels sensible to them at that moment. So that is why they end up doing it. And uh, to prevent that, it's we need to make sure we give them the help. Um, also, uh, speaking about the show and the slight criticism that I had about it is that a lot of people uh, took the wrong message from the show. Uh, I mean, the showmakers have tried to make sure that that doesn't happen, but uh, anyway, it has ended up happening that they feel that suicide has been glorified in the show. So what they say is that throughout the season, it all started because of the suicide of Hannah Baker. So it's like because she committed suicide, her story lived on and it left a mark and it uh, affected so many lives and it made sure that whoever had wronged her, like, you know, uh, got the consequence of it. So it felt like, you know, justice had happened because, uh, you know, Hannah had committed suicide and her story went on for so long. So, you know, people tend to get that idea that if I commit suicide or uh, like, you know, I might become a hero of some sort. Okay. Uh, and like, you know, people will actually, you know, their attention will go towards the people who have wronged me. So maybe, you know, taking this step will make my voice be heard. But um, as we say, that's not the truth. And uh, that's what uh, the show has failed to do at some level. Uh, because because that show has gained so much popularity and everything and it revolves around suicide, people tend to think that it's glorifying suicide. So here I would also like to say that while this can happen, the victims also need to take some responsibility. So when we say that the people around need to help, the victims themselves need to allow themselves to be helped. Okay, so there is some amount of responsibility within the victims to seek help. Otherwise, the people around won't be able to help. Okay, so having spoken about both the upside and the downside of the show, um, I'd like to say the final message that the show tried to give through everything that happened was that be kinder to each other. Okay, they say that multiple times in the show that, you know, let's be more kind to each other and let's be better listeners. Sometimes, you know, people don't even want you to, you know, respond to what they're saying. Maybe they only need you to listen. So try to be good listeners. Try to look around, okay, observe, look for symptoms. And if it feels like it's beyond your help, then please communicate someone who will be in a better position to help them. And um, there is a line that a uh, girl, the, a character from the show, uh, no, a guy who says a line to a girl in the show. Uh, he says that, uh, I love you more than life. Okay, and she says that don't love anything more than life. Okay, so that is something we all need to remember and, you know, always practice and make sure we help others practice that too. So I think that's my time. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Ramya. I think she covered more than what she was asked to and, that, and she did a very great job doing that. Um, just one just just one thing I would like to add to Ramya's uh, when she was criticizing the show and how it portrayed is the portrayal of all the elders in the show, especially uh, parents and the the counselors in the school. Um, the portrayal in the show was that if accounts if you go to a counselor to ask for help, things go wrong, which doesn't really happen in uh, in in the real world like you know you need to go speak to a counselor or even the authoritative figures of the school and all were all portrayed in a negative way which sometimes to some extent might be true but just to some extent might not only towards the last season they showed a little bit of kindness coming out from these authoritative figures um, even the parents were shown were kind of in the background and they weren't shown as to be so much as affected by everything that has been going on unless they have been uh unless their kids were victims like for example the 
I think Ramya already mentioned Clay, so I'm allowed to say Clay. So like Clay's parents or um, even Hannah Baker's mother. So yeah, so I think when when it comes to mental illness, you need to understand that it isn't something that only affects an individual. It also affects everyone around them, including their parents. So that's all I wanted to add on to what Ramya said. Uh, if Delia ma'am wants to say something more. Uh, no, no. I think I think Ramya covered everything pretty much, uh, and I think we can open up to questions now, if possible. Right. So, if anyone has any questions, put it up in the chat box, or um, if not, I'll just start off by asking one. Uh, this is for Delilah. Um, they say books usually transport you, like when you read books, and especially when they're very visual, very imagery, they transport you to the place that the book is talking about. When books portray mental illness and, you know, these kind of issues, it can get very dark. Like, because you're talking about something so heavy, it can get very dark. What suggestion would you give somebody who's probably already gone through something like this and reading a book that portrays mental illness can be a trigger to them what mm -hmm. suggestion would you give someone like that while they read the book so um i think i think the best way if if this person has genuinely gone through the same symptoms that maybe one of the characters the protagonist goes through i feel that the best way is to have a pre-existing support system already Okay, because I do understand that any books that talk about with any sort of trauma, uh, you do need to put the book down for a little while because it can get overwhelming. And the and the goal of reading is not to overwhelm and upset yourself, right? Because we don't want the reader to go, uh, move away from the book and not finish it. Because the point is the journey, right? The journey needs to be completed. So my advice would be. If there exists a person around you, or if you have a friend, maybe tell the friend, hey, I am going to be reading this, or even enlist the friend to also read it with you. And then I feel that way you are encouraging each other, like, have you finished the book? What did you think about the book? You know, you're encouraging each other to complete the journey, and you have somebody as support, and you know, you're not with just you and in your mind. Right? So it's going to be you, you're going to be thinking about a lot of bad things that have happened in the past and the characters' reflections as well. It will get a, it will get a little bit murky. So um, what I'd say is that um, just get somebody that you really trust and I think the experience will be a lot better. All right. Uh, thank you. There is a similar question to Ramya as well, if mm -hmm. she is still on. Um, it's, now, there are, it's not only about 13 Reasons Why. There are a lot of shows that mostly include teenagers, high school going uh, students from, and they're either set in like London or in uh, America, like 13 Reasons Why. And there's another one I watched called Skins, which is in London. Um, so how, I mean, wouldn't that, oh, yeah, so Jude asked pretty much the same question that I wanted to ask. How would that, wouldn't that in, uh, kind of negatively influence that person having a book or a movie themed on mental health with a tragic ending? Yeah, yeah. That question. Yeah, that is true. That, um when because uh, when you're reading a book or watching a show uh, you mo most of the times what happens is that you place yourself uh, you know in the shoes of the protagonist uh, right so whatever the protagonist is going through you feel like you are too so uh, when it has a tragic ending um, and you feel that you might also end up being like that uh, like the lala ma'am said it's always nice to have a support group with you uh, so always even shows like this, they say that um, it's, uh, first of all, it's uh, 18 plus the recommended viewership. And they also say that guided viewership is advised. So because those things are sensitive and a lot of people, you know, can be sensitive to it and, like, you know, actually believe that they are, you know, what the 
a character in the story is and you know if that happened to them that can happen to them too so always you know having a guidance a trusted adult with you while watching such things is always advised and i think that's one way to deal with it uh if you if you don't mind i'd like to add something um the there is a common misconception that shows books movies about mental health about people who have gone through mental health issues this is this is a huge misconception so a lot of the focus group that things like this are made for is for people who are with somebody who is going through a mental health issue so it the, the book the purpose of the book is not for a person to relive their trauma and then you know see how an alternate ending could have worked out but it's to sensitize and like i said to create peer respondents people who can be aware of somebody's situation without having to you know ask them like how are you feeling are you feeling that how deep are you feeling right questions like that so it's a dual purpose i would say all of these type of shows it's to not only to acknowledge the fact that hey there is a representation of people like this in media but it also helps to further the awareness and spread the message to uh not really literary sense but more towards the mental mental health and mental in the sense vinesia asks how, when when it comes to suicide how do you cope with the fact that someone you know has actually committed suicide like how can you expect, uh, accept the fact that you know they they're going to do it or it was hard for you to believe that they've done it and how do you cope up with all of this which then in turn causes you to feel that you're not worth living this is more of a question for maybe a psychologist so uh, <laughs> from the perspective of a psychology student what do you say and then maybe i could answer that yeah just to clarify what the question means uh, does she mean that because someone has committed suicide and dealing with that you also feel like suicidal yeah i think she she means kind of like a suicide contagion but not really just she feels like life is not worth living and things like that okay so see especially uh, when it is a close one who has committed suicide you know someone whom you meet every day or someone you have known for a long time uh, like you know of course it is hard like you know not just you said death by any means is like you know hard to deal with and uh, like you know it is hard to actually accept the fact that that has happened um a, lo- a lot that happens during that time is if you were actually close to that person or uh, you can have something called survivors guilt um so mm-hmm. um you can uh, feel guilty for what happened to that person and or you can feel that maybe i should have you know spoken to them or reached out to them or maybe somehow it's my fault that this happened to them so um it's always nice to take precautions as is always said so if something tragic like that does happen and you know after it has happened nothing can be done about it so all you can do at that time is take your time to uh, accept that and like you know to come to terms with that that a life has ended and just try to keep the good memories that you have with that person and just hope that they rest in peace and just have that memory in you so that you're always um vigilant and cautious about uh what is happening around you and to make sure that nothing like that happens to anyone else so what you might not be what you were not to that person maybe you could be to someone else so i think that process and like you know just um being with such people and just talking out to them about how you feel about the death of that person that can actually help you accept it the more you talk about it the more you know it sinks deep down and you realize it and you can make peace with it yeah also to to add on a little bit uh she already uh, ramya already spoke about uh, the guilt of a survivor but know that it isn't your fault for whatever happens with anyone around you uh it was a decision they made either on impulse or however it went through and it's not your fault for not noticing or for not being there for that person um but yeah you need to speak to your family which is very important because they are the ones who are there around you for most of the time speak to your friends who you 
are close to, uh, even if they know or they do not know that person. And it's important that you do not um, keep. Um, how do I put it? You do not keep memory memories in the sense you do not keep visual memories or physical memories of that person that constantly remind you again and again of what has happened. I hope that answered your question. Uh, the next one is by Pooja. She asks, how do you help someone who is reluctant to go to therapy because of the cost and the family issues? Um, do you want to answer this, Ramya, or should I take it? Um, Ramya, you're on mute. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, so maybe you should take that up because I'm not really aware of any free counseling or anyone with financial issues because if they do need professional help, then what other can what else can they do? All right. So, um, yes, it, the whole cost factor of therapy, it has been an issue, especially for uh, young adults and teenagers who do not want to tell their parents that they, are, they want to go into therapy. But then again, I advise you to do go and speak to your parents that you know you want to see a therapist because at the end of the day if a therapist finds you to be uh, in a, a position where you're in harm to yourself or to others they will have to inform your parents so it, it is it is not it's an obligation that they have to do um, there are a lot of therapies right now during the pandemic that are free of cost for a particular age group um, and that is only because keeping in mind that of this pandemic. Um, and secondly, there are a lot of clinics as well who offer some kind of incentive. Uh, like, for example, they put you on like a maybe a balance or they they check your family history and, and things like that, your income and, and everything. And they, they, are, they are considerate. And if someone is reluctant to go into therapy and you feel that they need it, you cannot really force them. You cannot pick them up and put them into therapy. Uh, you can All you can do is talk to them, tell them, see, these are things that you're going through. You've spoken to me about it. However, I can't really help you because I'm your friend. I can only support you. But I really think that you should speak to a professional professional maybe go once see what they say and things like that you know be a little supportive but uh, always guide them into going to speak with a professional i can't really speak much about family issues because that is probably something anyone would divulge in uh, in a closed safe environment where you know not a lot of people would want to talk about i hope that answers your question puja there's a question from ryle uh, which says, when it comes to 13 reasons why, one of the biggest controversy was the use of shock value over proper portrayal of traumatic incidents. Why is it so important to portray these incidents respectively? And how can a show address these incidents respectively? Okay. Yeah, so uh, I didn't actually get the question. Um, did he mean that uh, they're focusing more on the consequences of what happened than what actually happened? Uh, no. So what the, the biggest controversy that is around 13, one of the biggest, is that when they portrayed the whole scene of suicide of Hannah Baker's, they did it in a very dramatic fashion. Mm -hmm. I think this is what he means. They did it in a very dramatic fashion. And even the the scene in the toilet, the uh, sexual assault uh, in the toilet, was done in a very dramatic fashion, and it, it took a long time. Usually they have about three seconds or so, I'm not really sure, that the film or a particular show or a film is allowed for mm -hmm. such incidents. So yeah. his question is around that, and how, why is it important to portray these incidents respectively, mm -hmm. and how can the show address the incidents respectively? 
Yeah, so uh, about that, uh, all the traumatic incidences that they have shown in the show, be it uh, the rape or any kind of sexual assault that has happened, uh, it has it has been said, uh, you know, even after by the makers of the show, that they ha we have portrayed that on screen longer than it is comfortable, longer than it's comfortable for someone to see. And they said that's because it is not supposed to be comfortable. They want to make you feel uncomfortable so that you understand the gravity of the situation and how, uh, you know, bad that is. Because unless you're a victim, all you can do is, you know, try to imagine and experience how, uh, like, you know, how bad it can be. So that is why they have portrayed it probably for this for like, you know, longer than maybe most uh, movies and TV shows do so that you understand. And like, you know, even if you're not a victim, uh, you at least understand what a perpetrator can do to a victim and like, you know, how bad it can be. So probably that's the reason. And just to add on to that, I think the, 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 the point of this show was to create awareness, to kind of hit yeah. everyone in a place where it hurts a lot, make them think about everything that is going on, because none of the incidents that have happened in the show is something to be taken lightly, something to be uh, or is not very, you know, something to be shown lightly. Uh, but I understand your question wherein it should be respective enough for people who have gone through maybe these traumatic experience to be able to watch and not relive those situations. But then again, uh, it's, it's very difficult to please everyone and yet send a message. So, um, yeah, but I hope this, that your question was answered. And I think it's uh, maybe a film maker or a producer would be able to answer the more technical question of how a show can address a situation like that, respectively. Um, any more questions from anyone? If there are not, I think I have one last question for Delilah. Uh, maybe we can end it with that. Um, Delilah, you there? Yeah, yeah I'm here. Yeah. Uh, so my question is, we spoke a lot about the text. We spoke a lot about how many texts portray uh, characters of mental illness and mental health. But just by reading them, you don't really, uh, it, sometimes you don't focus on the theme of mental illness and mental health, right? You maybe focus on everything else. How can an English literature professor or an English literature teacher uh, kind of make their students aware or focus more on these themes and sensitize them and try to end the stigma that is around mental health? Um, okay. So uh, a lot of that there can be a lot of creative exercises that you resort to when it comes to talking about why a fiction on mental health. Uh, but I'd say this. Uh, first of all, the first step would be adding a lot more uh, novels or any nonfiction into your syllabus. Once you have these sort of books to pick and choose from, then that's the best part. You can ask students, or you can ask like whoever you're uh, instructing to, you can ask to imagine themselves in the place of the uh, character or in place of the protagonist. Now let's take 13 reasons why itself, right? So uh, according to the article that I uh, referenced in my slides uh, from uh, Kia Jane uh, Richmond, Kia Jane Richmond, she talks about her, um, her attempts to integrate uh, a, a huge focus of mental health and the issues that all the kids are going through in that school, right? And what she did was she assigned each personality of the, the each character, sorry, not personality, each character to a particular student and she asked them to maintain secret Facebook accounts, okay? So these are accounts that are not shared to the public but can be shared to the class, right? And she asked them, read the book, okay? Because 13 Reasons Why it talks about so many issues and kind of confronts a lot of these sort of like things that you can't focus on everything at the same time. So what she did is she simplified the matter, she streamlined it, and in that way, each student was able to just 
spend time with one of the characters and think about the consequences and effects that that particular character had on everybody else okay and uh, in a similar way as you can you can have a lot of other exercises where you have smaller groups of uh, students talking about um maybe alternatives of what could the character have done what could the character have not done uh, an interesting thing also that we could do with certain reasons would be having the adults uh, a perspective of, from the adults right instead of doing it from clays and uh, hannah's perspective we can take the same book and talk about it from the adults perspective and how they saw this and why they saw it the way that they did right by breaking it down can you, only by breaking it down can you understand something like this because i think all of honestly that are written well are complex novels and you have to take the time to kind of spend time with each of the themes in order to understand it truly so i guess it depends on personal preference also at time all right um there's another question for ma'am delila and let's let's make this one the last one okay. uh it says how closely is pen, uh, penning down feelings emotions and mental health related like if a person writes about grief or lament is it necessary that he or she is going through pain or some mental issue okay so uh so that i just understand it properly you are asking whether um the act of transcribing what's inside your head onto paper using language is a 100% transfer is that what you're asking you're asking you whether how legitimate mm. is what comes out on the paper no i think what they're asking is if i put something down like some sometimes people write about grief about death about mm -hmm. uh different things you know lost love and things like that mm -hmm. are you actually going through something like that oh uh well that 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 you can interpret that question from two ways i would say um authors that write about certain things don't necessarily have to go through it they might have second person or third person uh, experience right with something like this but for responsible writing of any sort of literature you need to do your research so that way you can come closest to the genuine portrayal of every emotion it is that you want to put down on paper okay uh when it comes to like the way i understood that the previous question that i mentioned is how genuine can these pieces of literature be right so uh, i don't think like in philosophy there are multiple concepts that they talk about how the human mind cannot transfer everything that's inside their head onto paper right so that's something that we have to live with and that shouldn't be a drawback honestly to tell you the truth because everybody complete each other i will write about one aspect of grief and maybe somebody else will write about another aspect of grief and the best part is that when you discover each of these pieces it helps you build a bigger jigsaw of like understanding when it comes to certain aspects you're reading about hey so yeah that that's i think my answer and uh, just to add on to Del what delila said from a perspective of a psychologist it's actually the other way around maybe i would say uh, usually people who have uh, mental health mental health issues or who are going through some kind of problem they take to writing because that is a clearer way to put down their thoughts and understand what they're thinking however if and we as psychologists also tell our clients to write a diary keep a diary make sure you write all of your thoughts because that way you remember you understand you know exactly what your feelings are your emotions are about certain things doesn't necessarily mean that i'm not sure whether when you said mental issues you meant mental illness or mental health because mental health is anything and everything mental health is just taking care of your mental health and your mental stability and you being in good sound mind not being stressed not being angry things like that so mental health is that mental illnesses on the other hand is a very difficult uh, which needs more time needs more effort to get through to a person with mental illnesses so when you said mental issues i'm going to think of mental health issues um so no 
I would say not necessarily if a person writes about grief or about pain that they are at that moment going through it. However, it is a possibility that at some point of their life they have gone through it because everyone goes through these kind of small um, problems once upon a time in their life. And when they want to write something down, they just take themselves back, or at least that's what I do. I just take myself back to that place when I was feeling what I was feeling and putting it down. Um, so yeah, just like ma'am Delilah said, you know, just putting it down uh, or thinking about how you want to write and what you want to transcribe. You can't really put everything down on the paper, but you can be responsible enough to do certain things. I hope that answered your question. All right. So um, that's the end of today's session. And thank you everyone for coming and participating and asking a lot of questions and being interactive. Uh, thank you, Delilah. And thank you, Ramya, for being here, taking the time out uh, from your busy schedule and being a part of this talk. Much appreciated. Also, Ramya, I hope you have uh, a very fruitful years ahead. You're just in your second year. So uh, <laughs> I hope Thank you me. have a very good. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it was a, g a good number. And uh, very, everybody was really uh, thoughtful about the questions that they put forward. I hope we they answered your question. I am available if you'd like any recommendations or any clarifications regarding my whatever I presented. Uh, my email is ddp008 at choglaze.ac.in. Just before we sign off, I just have one, two things to say. One is that we toss around the words of depression, OCD, uh, bipolar, very casually around when they're not actually casual. And um, mental illnesses, I mean, they, they are mental illnesses that cause or that are very devastating and take a toll on you and your family. So if we think that we've moved beyond stereotyping individuals who are going through mental health issues and mental uh, illnesses, then we have a very, very long way to go. And when it comes to, edu especially when it comes to educating people. So I hope that, uh, you know, you take something from this and these terms that we use more frequently now that, you know, mental health matters and mental, uh, we need to think about our mental health and all of that we actually stop using, we, we think about when we're using them so that we don't stigmatize people and the stigma that is around it kind of goes away. So on that note, uh, also answering questions, we do have sessions and give sessions at Olive Counseling where you can check out our website, uh, olivecounseling.com. We have, we post videos on YouTube. The session will also be on YouTube. So go check that out. Also, uh, go check out for, for anyone who's still in high school and hasn't gone to college and you're thinking of pursuing literature, go check out uh, English Tigers YouTube channel. They've put up a lot of events that they do and a lot of podcasts. Uh, a lot of vlogs on what they do and the teachers speak and everything so go check that out and subscribe to them as well so thank you for being here uh it was great having you all have a good day all of you thank you